and we attempt great things for God. We hope and pray that you had a wonderful week and in spite of the current situation that we find ourselves in over the past 10 weeks of quarantine, that God has still been good to you and his favor has been upon you and your family. We want to thank you for logging on this morning. There are hundreds of platforms that are currently running at this time where you could actually, you know, choose to give your time and your allegiance. But we want to thank you for logging on to this platform. And to our members, it wouldn't be the same without you. We hope that you stay safe and we look forward to once this thing is lifted, we can reunite and fellowship back together at our usual location. Again, friends, if you have not, we encourage you guys to subscribe to the church's YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in Wellington SDA, hit the notification and the bell. What it does, it notifies you when we go live and when we upload videos. And also, also subscribe to the Final Movements, um, my YouTube channel rather. Um, go to YouTube, type my name in and subscribe. Hit the notification, the bell. So as we upload videos and series that you'll be notified and you can be blessed by the content that is on this particular um, site channel. Also, friends, we want to highlight um, that our, the Wellington SDA, we do have our prayer ministry. And our prayer line, if you would like to submit <coughs> requests, you can dial it in, 305-676-4113. That's to make your request audibly. And our times of operation, you can join on, 561-440. 6854 and we operate from 5 a.m. Sunday through Saturday mon mornings and middays from 12 p.m. <coughs> Sundays through Fridays and evenings at 7 p.m. <coughs> Mondays through Thursdays. And so friends, we believe that more is still accomplished by prayer than by preaching. And as long as we live, we should pray. It is only as we pray that we live. And also this morning, I just received a text from a friend of mine in Bermuda, that, and I'm going to ask that all of us to pray, Sister Evans, if you can, um, you know, put this on the prayer agenda also, please. His name is Elder Michael Ray. Michael Ray, his son, Damien Ray, spoke at Acreage a few years ago. Um, I think it was a youth day. A wonderful sermon he did. But his father suffered a heart attack this morning in Bermuda. And he's going to be airlifted out of the country um, this afternoon, you know, because of the whole quarantine issue and the, and the, um, the COVID-19, his wife will not be able to accompany him. So we're asking that we will you pray for him. His name is Elder Michael Ray. I'm asking everyone who will view this, um, who are viewing live or view the rebroadcast, that you remember Elder Michael Ray, please, in your prayers. He is a stalwart. Um, for that part of the, the world in the church, a man who loves the Lord and who has served as a Bible worker and who has led many to Jesus Christ working with the Bermuda Conference. So please keep him in your prayers and his family, his wife and his children. So please um, give care to that, right? Also, again, friends, you know, here at our, our platform, we believe what Habakkuk says, that we ought to write the vision and make it plain. And so we do have study guides for everything that we do and if you have not or you desire to receive a study guide do email us at info at wellington sda.com or c dot not at the final movements.com we'll do our best to get these lessons out to you and to add you to our mailing list we want you guys to have something in your hand which you can go back over and review the, the lessons that we'll study and so you can be blessed more thoroughly. Now we're going to have a word of prayer once more and move right into our, our study. So at this time, as far as possible, um, can you please kneel with me in, in prayer? <coughs> Let us pray. O most kind and loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful that you woke us up this morning and you allowed the breath of life to remain in our mortal bodies. And we are assembled once more, Lord, in this unique fashion because we realize our soul's dire need for a closer walk with you. And that walk can only be gained through studying the word and knowing Christ for her, ourselves and the truths for this time. 
We ask even that you please forgive us of our sins, dear Father, and that you will be with us as we open your inspired book. May, you, may, your, may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, we pray. And also, Father, we want to lift up Elder Ray at this time, who has suffered a, a massive heart attack, and he's about to be airlifted um, out of the country of Bermuda, island of Bermuda. We pray that you will be with him in his transition, dear Father. And as he reached to the hospital, Lord, we know that hospitals are now uh, a haven for virus. And even with the COVID-19, Lord, we pray that you'll put your hand over your child. You'll grant the doctors the, 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 the wisdom they need to go in and to make things better. And that you will restore him to health. And we ask not our will, but thy will be done over his life is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right, we are going to study now, and we hope you have your Bibles, friends. And again, we are using uh, the good old 1611 version, the King James Version. We hope you have your study guides and you have something to write. Now, if you haven't been able to print off the study guides, get a piece of paper and write the answers down and so you can fill them in when you get your lesson at hand. Now, we are still on our series. We hope you have been blessed by it. I've been getting a lot of positive feedback by this series. Um, uh, the Desert Lessons, a very dusty lesson. And we're on lesson number nine this Lord's Day. And we'll be looking at, under the caption, the mixed multitude. The mixed multitude. Now, our thematic text for this, for this series is Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The Apostle Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. So friends, we can gleam hope, galvanize hope, from the experiences that of those who have gone on before us. And we do need some hope, especially in these days of hopelessness. Our thematic quote is taken from Testimonies to Ministers, page 31. Some of the Lord says, that we as a people, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. And we are admonished, friends, over and over, that there are three chapters that we should seek to read at least once per week. Psalms 105, Psalms 106, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Why? Because they rehearse the history of, of ancient Israel. So I pray that as we, as you make time for everything else, for life, that you'll make time to read these chapters in the Bible, at least once per week, and learn from history. And we, are, we know this much more, that what people learn is that they never learn from history. Now we're going to begin our study. We're using the study, the question and answer mode, the catechized mode, and we're filling in the blanks, in most cases, sometimes the yellow or in some times the red. Now, question number one now says, now, what kind of arm did God use to deliver his people out of Egypt? Let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalms 136. Let's take our Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalms 136. We're going to focus on verse number 10. That's Psalms 136, verse number 10. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost now, penned these words. He said, to him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercies endureth forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. And verse number 12 says now, with a strong hand, with a strong hand, and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endureth forever. So the Bible says that the Lord used a strong arm, and this arm shook the very foundation, the existence of the Egyptian dynasty. And Pharaoh and the Egyptians were, were eager to see Israel be delivered from their grasp, their clutches. And friends, let me say this. This same arm that was available over 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, is still available today. The Lord can deliver you out of your situation. 
from that particular sin that so easily beset you, that sin that so easily molests you. God is able, my dear friends. Let us not give up on God. Let us hold to the promises of God. Let us hold to God's unchanging arm. Now, number two now says now, who else came out of Egypt with God's people? Let's go to Exodus 12 now. Who else came out of Egypt with God's people? In the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 37, the Bible says now, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses. Now, they were lodged in Ramses at Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides the children. So, friends, just, let's just pause there. Now, we know that the Exodus... Um, brought out about 3.5, 2.5 million people. But here the Bible begins to give us now a numerical, uh, a picture of the people. Over 600,000 on foot, right? Not counting the children, right? And then another group, right? 38 says now, and a mixed multitude went up also with them and their flocks and their herds and their cattle and them problem lord I have mercy these people had more problems than you can shake a stick at so fill it in now the mixed multitude came up out of Egypt with them with them brothers and sisters the mixed multitude caused more problems in the movement than you can shake a stick at and the, they are still alive today within the church altered in form but same in nature. Are you a mixed multitude? Am I a mixed multitude? No, we are told now. Ellen White says this now. Right, this is from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3. She says, There was a quite large number of Egyptians who were led to acknowledge by the manifestation of the signs and wonders shown in Egypt that the God of the Hebrews were the only true God. They entreated to be permitted to come into the house of the Israelites with their families upon the fearful night when the angel of God should slay the firstborn of the Egyptians. They were convinced, but not converted. Some of them, they were convinced that their gods, plural, whom they had worshipped were without knowledge and had no power to save or destroy. And they pledged, they made a promise, they pledged themselves to henceforth choose the God of Israel as their God. They decided to leave Egypt and go with the children of Israel to worship their God. The Israelites welcomed the believing Egyptians to their houses. So friends, we have three classes of people that came out of Egypt. One, the Israelites. Two, the Egyptians. And three, the mixed multitude. Don't confuse them. Three classes of people. We had the Egyptians the Israelites, and the Bible speaks of the mixed multitude. Now, number three now says now, who was responsible for bringing these people, the mixed multitude, out of Egypt? In the book of Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is now rehearsing the history of the Exodus. Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews, let's take our Bibles. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse number 16. Hebrews 3, verse number 16. Are we there? Hebrews 3, verse 16. Friends, I want you to get your Bibles. Mark your Bibles, friends. We need to highlight these things for ourselves. Look at verse 16. The Bible says now, context the Exodus. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. How be it? Not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So, friends, by Moses. So, Moses did not bring most out. And in Exodus 12, verse 38, the Bible says now, And a mixed multitude went up with them and their flocks and herds. So, friends, the answer is no. Moses did not bring them out of Egypt. They came out. And we must understand, brothers and sisters, not everything that comes in your life, even though it may have the hand of Christ upon it, is from God. Not everybody whom you let in your sphere knows your best interests or has your best interests, friends. Not everyone 
who comes into your sphere, your space, your surrounding, even though they say they are a Christian, may be brought there by God. The text says, with them. That word, with them, is a very cogent word. It indicates that they were not of them, but they were strangers. Now, I have learned this, brothers. We've learned that the Lord displayed signs and wonders to bring them out of Egypt. But it's a sad reality that signs and wonders does not always equal faith. There is no connection of faith and seeing a wonder because these people saw the signs. They saw the hand, the DNA, the fingerprint of God over Egypt, yet they perished in the wilderness because of unbelief, friends. This is serious. This is serious, and I want to say this. If we will not be moved by the words of this book, then there is no sign or wonder in the heavens or in the earth that can move you. If we will not be moved by the thus saith the Lord, by these words, friends, there is no miracle that can be got that which the word of God cannot be got. And that's why there is not so much a display of signs and wonders in the world today. Because God knows if we are not moved and challenged by the word of God itself, then no miracle or sign and wonder will ever move you. So we understand that they came, they, they came out of Egypt, the mixed multitude. Now let's now look at their origin. How did they, why were they called the mixed multitude? What, what, what was their DNA, their makeup now? Number four now, who were the mixed multitudes? And what was their origin, their genesis? Who were they? Were they a product of amalgamation? Did they just evolve? Who were they? Now, friends, in my study of the Bible and history and spirit of prophecy, we find this about their origin. Fill it in now. They were the offspring. Fill it in. They were the offspring of marriages which were contracted between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Hold on. We have a problem, Houston. They were the offspring, the seed, the posterity, the children of marriages which were contracted, not by God, between the Israelites and the Egyptians and then Houston. We have a problem. They were very small in number in comparison to the, to the masses, but great in evil and in influence. But we learned last week that a little leaven live in a whole lump. Even though the Israelites could not bring leaven in their homes at the Passover, leaven came out of Egypt with them. The mixed multitude were the leaven. Friends, they were the ones that hindered, that retarded, that delayed the entrance of Israel into Egypt in most of the instances, friends. They were the ones, and I want to say this, friends, it was not God's intent for us to be around in 2020, 2020. It was God's intent for us to be in heaven a long time ago. Could it be then, because of the mixed multitude amongst us, that leavening, instru uh, that leavening instrument, it has delayed Christ's coming, therefore the Seventh-day Adventist community is responsible for World War I, World War II, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. We are responsible for Pearl Harbor. We are responsible for all the evils in the world. We are responsible for 9-11 and the coronavirus. Why? Seeing that we have delayed Christ's coming. We are told the sins of the world lieth at the church's door, friends. There is a leavening amongst us. The mixed multitude are, are alive today, altered in form, but same in nature and mentality. Now, friends, again, it was never God's intent for his people to, to ever intermarry with the heathen. As a matter of fact, go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah. As they, as the, in Nehemiah's day, there was a same situation. The, 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 the Israelites were in Babylon captivity. And as they returned from the exile now, Nehemiah was disappointed at the marriages and their offspring. Nehemiah 13, look at verse number 23. Nehemiah 13, verse 23, the Bible says in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah says, In those days 
I saw Jews, a.k.a. Adventists, a.k.a. Israelites, that had married the wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and Moab. Moab. Moabites. Right? And they're, now guess who suffered from the union now? And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak the Jews' language. So the children suffered because the father was a heathen, the mother was an Israelite, the father worshipped idols, the mother the true God, the father wasn't a vegetarian, the, and so the children grew up confused. One day they go on su Sunday, next day on Sabbath, there was confusion, friend. And the Bible says, and I contend and could not speak the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. Verse 25 says, and I contend with them, and I cursed them, and I smote certain of them, and plucked off their hairs, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take your daughters unto your sons for yourselves. 26 says, Did not Solomon, the wisest man of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there, not, was there no king like him, whom was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish woman cause to sin. 27 says now, shall we hearken unto you to do this great evil, what evil? Into marriage, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, better to live, better to live by yourself a single life than to marry somebody who is not of your faith. And even, a matter of fact, we have enough problems marrying people who are of the faith. Let alone you're going to take somebody who don't have a clue about him because he looks good. Because she has nice hair and, and, and teeth and all that kind of uh, external stuff. Foam. Are you with me, friends? And so the children now suffered. The children suffered. And so, the chi and I'm going to show you, friends, the problem we're having in the church today is, is the people who were a product of a mixed marriage. I'm going to show you in a spiritual sense. Now, Spurgeon says this, friends, you cannot break Christ's law in order to find a good husband or a good wife. His rule is that you should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. It is a wise, wise and a kind of rule, and is it as a, a, an assistant or a hindrance? For marriage, he says now, I have never met with a single case in which marriages of this kind have been blessed of God. If you break Christ's law, we cannot expect Christ's blessing. And so the mixed multitude, they were a product of, of mixed marriages, procreation, and the children, they were confused. They were confused and they brought the confusion into Israel. And I'm going to show you, friends, as it was in the physical, so it is in the spiritual Nine-tenths of the problem that exists in the church today is because of a spiritual, uh, a, a, a spiritual alliance. And so the offspring of this alliance now are the problem in the church today, right? So here we see, friends, that the Israelites, they left Goshen. You know, we oftentimes hear this cliche, there's no pretty girl in the church. That's not true. Or no, no, there's no pretty men in the church. That's not even a word anyway, right, in the church. So, friends, they had left Goshen, where, where light was. They had gone down into Egypt. And the Egyptians were a very beautiful woman. And I've learned you can paint beauty on. You can pin beauty on. You can inject beauty in. You can glue beauty in. And they chose beauty over virtue. And as a result now, friends, offsprings were born. They were not Israelites. They were not Jews. They were half-breed. They were mixed up, tangled up, wrapped up, never opposed, never defend, never, never for, nor with. They were just, in some cases, neutral. The origin of the mixed multitude. As it was in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. Now, when they came out of Egypt now, let's now look at their separation. Question number five now says now, did the mixed multitude dwell... In the same encampment with the Israelites. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 23. Moses now is laying down the law, the rule as they came out of Egypt as to the, to the, the habitation, the quarantine, the sectionization of the various 
ethnic groups. Look what Moses says now in the book of Deuteronomy 23. Look at verse number 8. Deuteronomy 23. Look at verse, beginning at verse number 7. Right? The Bible says this now. Moses says now. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast an stranger in his land. Verse number 8 says now. And the children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. God in his goodness had to purge, he could not bring them in at that time. He had to say, wait until the, now in the Bible, fourth year is his generation. That's almost 120 years of purging. Why would God have to purge them out? Oh, friends, these people were polytheistic. They were wrapped up tangled up in witchcraft, rebellion, murmuring. And so God could not allow this leaven to be in the general dwelling. So God had to separate them. He had to purge them out. And isn't the case. Sometimes we are so licky licky for lack of a word, are so greedy for numbers that as soon as a person is baptized, because that man may have a degree or he speaks well or he smells well or he lives on Sugar Hill. We put that person in office. As a matter of fact, I remember I did a campaign outside the country and I was at the, at the I had, we were brought, I was invited to lunch at a doctor's home. Very fluent guy and his wife has been a long time member in the church. And all of a sudden, the man got baptized not within, within, within a week of election. And they had elected the man to be the health and temperance leader for the, for the church. And the wife objected to it. She says, not because he's a medical doctor means he is fit to medicate the people of God. And the man said, he says, not, I was surprised they asked me because I, I don't know anything. But because I'm, I have an MD behind my name and friends, isn't it the case that sometimes we don't let God detox people? Just because a man sit through a four-week campaign doesn't mean he has been fully detoxed. Let God detox him. Let him, let him, let him uh, divest himself of all those weird theologies. And so God in his goodness now had to keep them outside the camp. As a matter of fact, in Nehemiah 13, jot it in your handout, Nehemiah 13, verse 3, same thing with Nehemiah. When they came back from the exile, Nehemiah said now, now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated Israel from all the multitude. There was a separation until the third generation. Friends, if we would follow that principle and don't just put people in off because they, because they speak well or because they drive a BMW or because their tithing, their dollar is a little bit more heavier than the nickels. There was a separation. They could not dwell. So the answer is no, they could not dwell in the same encampment until the third. Because again, friends, they were toxic. They were living. And God knew this in his foreknowledge. That if I let these people to mingle, and isn't the case, friends, you'll find even in our institutions. What do we do? This boy has been expelled from five schools. This boy is rotten and a rotten egg. And what do our schools do? In the name of Jesus, we take this boy in with his problems. And if we're not careful, this boy now begins to corrupt our children. They're already weak already. You're going to add this element, friends. We need to reevaluate our admittance rate. We need to evaluate things. As it was in the physical, so must it be even in the spiritual. We're told now this now. She says the mixed multitude that had accompanied Israel from Egypt were not, what? Permitted, are you with me? To occupy the same quarters with the, with the tribes, but were to abide on the outskirts of the camp and their offsprings now, watch it now, their offspring, not them, their offsprings were to be excluded from the community until the third generation. That's a long time of detoxification. That's a big word I found today, right? They got to detox them of paganism and wickedness 
and even witchcraft. Now, friends, as we said, that these people, they were menace to the movement. And you're going to find out that whenever God calls a movement into existence, now we covered the three Israel, the original one in the wilderness, 31 AD, a 34 AD, God switched to the Christian church, and then the dark ages now produced a new Israel. So three Israel, three Exodus, and so within each of these movements, you're going to have that small amount of mixed multitude, very small in number, but powerful in evil and in influence, a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. You're going to find them. They were in the wilderness, in the New Testament church, who brought in Judas, who brought in Ananias and Sapphira, who brought in Simon Magnus. They were, they were there. And they are also within the Adventist church today, altered in form, but they are same in nature. We are told this now. It is Satan's plan to bring into the church insincere, unregenerate elements that will encourage doubt, unbelief, and hinder all who desire to see the work of God advance and advance with it. Many who have no real faith in God or his word assent to some principles of truth and thus are enabled to introduce their errors as scriptural doctrine. In every age, Satan has been successful to bring in this element, the mixed multitude is leavening process, and it has retarded the work. It has kept the people of God wandering, wandering, wandering. Now, who are they today? Can we find them today within God's church, friends? Yes. Now, let me say this. They are a product. Remember, we, we showed you that the mixed multitude were, were a product of the, the procreation or the marriages of the Egyptians and the Israelites. So when they procreated, they gave birth to the mixed multitude. Now, in our day, a large share of them are a product, hear me now, of a faulty educational system. Let that one settle in, friends. Today's mixed multitude in our church, churches, in, in some cases, they are the product of a faulty educational system, a broken system. Now, friends, let me qualify. I am not against education, Christian education. Let me say it again. I believe in Adventist education. I believe in it. All my children currently attend Adventist school. Kindergarten, middle school, and high school. My eldest daughter has to be bused uh, over an hour to Miami because there's no academy in Broward County. So we, we, if we didn't believe in that, friends, we wouldn't. There's plenty of public school could send her too, but we don't, we, we don't subscribe to that, friends. My wife is an educator at the Adventist school. I myself taught at the Adventist uh, academy. So I am not against it. I believe in it. But friends, it has its problems. And you're going to find that the problem that it, that it has, has produced the mentality of mixed multitude that are leavening the churches all around the world, especially North America. And I don't say it to be critical. I say it to sustain truth, brothers and sisters. I believe in education. I'm going to show you now, right? We are told. So now please read now this paragraph loud and clear now. The light has been given me that tremendous pressures will be brought upon every Seventh-day Adventist with whom the world can get into close connection. All right, stop. The world. Now remember, Egypt is a type of the world, right? It's not in your handout, but the reference is, I'm going to give it to you in a moment, right? Please read now. Those who seek the education that the world esteems so highly are gradually led further and further from the principles of truth until they become educated worldlings. Did you get that, friends? Educated worldlings. She goes on to say, please read. At what a price have they gained their education? 
They have parted with the Holy Spirit of God. Did you hear that, friends? Ichabod is written. God is gone. Keep on reading now. They have chosen to accept what the world calls knowledge in the place of the truths which God has committed to men through his ministers and prophets and apostles. Did you hear that, friends? Right? She goes on to say. And there are some who, having secured this worldly education. Watch it now. Think that they can introduce it into our schools. And they have. And what has happened now with this introduction now, an amalgamation has taken place now and has given birth to a mentality of people that is no better off than the mixed multitude. Please read, she says now. But let me tell you that you must not take what the world calls the higher education and bring it into our schools and sanitariums and churches. And friends, let me pause right there. It has happened because we no longer have sanitariums. Th th that, that's a relic of the dark ages, right? Keep on reading, please. We need to understand these things. I speak to you definitely. This must not be done. All right, friends. And what she wrote has now happened, friends. Another reference, she says, Shall we bring into our schools the sower of tears? Question. Shall we permit men, men who are called great and yet who have been taught by the enemy of all truth, Satan himself, to have the education of our youth? Shall you place these men to sit in our colleges and teach? She says, or shall we take the word of God as our guide and have our schools conducted more after the order of ancient schools of the prophets, friends? It's a question, friends. And what has happened now, friends, what she warned against has come to pass. And friends, here it is now. It has given because of the education of the world now. We have taken the way the, the, there, there's a mentality now in the mixed multitude. That's how that's their origin today in our church in some in some instances. And a large share of them can be traced back to the faulty educational system that they have been a product of and so this mentality is alive today who are they the adventist movement faces the same temptations and dangers and therefore cursed with the mixed multitude who are they here they are they must be the murmurers the complainers the critics idolaters fornicators and the worldly element who are always lusting after the world and babylon they are the unconverted, the half-converted, the pseudo-converted. They have a serious theory of truth without the experience of righteousness. They are the Babylonians, or at best, half-Christians, half-Worlians, half-Israelites, half-Egyptians. They follow the Lord afar off, and they remain on the outskirts of the camp. They are the worldly element that are always seeking to bring to the church worldly pleasures, worldly policies. And we have some, some sick worldly policies that, 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 that govern us today. Devilish in its nature and its origin, right? And worldly amusements. The mixed multitude in modern Israel have kept the movement wandering around in the wilderness of sin for many years. They have kept back the latter rain and have delayed the coming of Christ. They are leaders and followers in the apostasies of which have been many and will many more be. They are the, 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 the originators, right? They commit the abominations in the church over which the faithful are sign and crying when the seal of God is impressed. They are the foolish virgins and the evil servants who, have, who say in their heart, Oh, my Lord, the lath is coming and therefore become careless and worldly. They must be kept on the outskirts of the camp and not be allowed to control the church. Don't vote them in office. Whether well, presidents, secretaries, treasurers, clerk, whoever they are, head elder, don't vote them in office. You need to object, speak up and speak out in these nominating committee meetings uh, to make up or dominate the church's leadership, brothers and sisters. This is where we are, friends. Now, we're going to now shift now 
from what they are to what they did. Number seven now, in which three events did the mixed multitude lead the children of Israel to rebel against God? There were three. Now, we're told this, friends. Ellen White says this. Please read on the mixed multitude. The mixed multitude who traveled with Israel but were never of Israel caused most of the troubles along the way to the promised land. Stop there. So we can't blame them with everything. We have to be fair. They didn't cause all. They caused most. And most of the serious apostles can be traced back to them. Keep on reading. They were the authors uh -huh. of most of the apostasies and rebellions that delayed the entrance of Israel into the promised land for 40 years. Lord have mercy. Now, the word apostasy really means decline. It really means to de it defined as a total desertion of or departure from one's religion, one's principles, one's party, one's cause. So when, when we say a man is in apostasy, that man has abandoned his religious principles, his cause. Now, there are three major rebellions. Now, we won't go into them entirely because we have whole lectures on them. We're going to hit the high points that the mixed multitude were the authors of. The first one, fill it in now, they, were, they, 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 they showed their contempt for health reform. They bucked and rebelled against the health reform that God wanted to give his people in the wilderness. Now, I have Numbers 11, 32 on the screen, but I want you to focus on Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Verse 1 through 6. You're going to find out that God brought them out. And God was now about to give them a diet that is conducive for health, for strength, for life and longevity. Look who began to murmur, Nathan. Look who began to complain against God. Friends, they that complain then are the same ones who are complaining today. Numbers chapter 11. Are we there? Verse 1 says now, And when the people complain, this belly aching, says we, we murmur too much. We have enough. We have in, and we still complain. We are never satisfied in comparison to what other world, uh, the rest of the world have. When the people complained, it what? It displeased God. God is, God is, it, God, God, God is not happy when we complain. And the Lord heard it. And the Bible says now, and his anger was what? Kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them. That were in the uttermost part of them. So, friends, fire. Cons this is in the Bible. It's not some bedtime story, friends. When we complain, we're setting ourselves up to, 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 to be consumed. Don't take complaining lightly. Our children's murmur. They, 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 you, the more and the more they murmur, the more we give them. We enable their murmuring. Right? Look at verse number four now. Verse four says this now. And the mixed multitude. Right? That was among them fell a lusting. That's a bad word, lust. And the children of Israel also up again. So here we see the multitude. They began to murmur. And this cancer now spread within the camp and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Who shall give us chicken to eat? Who shall give us beef to eat? Who shall give us mutton, oxtail, manish water? Well, they said, Good for your daughter. Who shall give us. This to eat. The Bible says, look at their mentality now. For we remember the fish. And we learned a few Sabbaths ago that fish was, a, what, what, the Egyptians had a lot of fish. That's why when God just turned an island to blood, he cut off their food supply, right? We remember, oh boy, we remember the SKV fish, king fish, snapper, talk to me, doctor fish, sprat, which we ate in Egypt, underscore, freely. With the cucumbers, Lord have mercy, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. That was some good fish. They ate it. And the Bible says now, but now our souls is dried away, and there is nothing beside this old manna beside our eyes. Friends, that is discontent. These people began to murmur against, they began to buck health reform. 
And you have people today in the church that they will vote for the church to serve meat and chicken and fish. You have pastors who when they come to a church, the first thing they attack is the diet. You need some chicken foot in the soup, friends. It's a mixed multitude mentality. That's why they can't understand eternal things. They're always arguing, voting for flesh to be served on the church premises and, 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 and in our function. It's the mixed multitude. We are told. Petra Prophet, she says this. They had manifested, there it is, a discontent. That's a strong word. With the food provided to them by their creator. God who knows best. I'm going to give you manna. So friends, here we see that they were the authors in the rebellion against health reform. They wanted the meat. Look what she says in manuscript 38, 1898. Please read now. The state of mind has largely to do with the health of the body. Uh -huh. And especially with the health of the digestive organs. Uh -huh. As a general thing. The Lord did not provide his people with flesh meat in the desert uh -huh. because he knew that the use of this diet would create disease and insubordination. Stop there. Now, we won't go into this too much because we have a whole lecture on this, quills and manna. But I'm going to show you, friends, that the insubordination today that we are seeing in our church is, can be traced largely to the diet. Please read. In order to modify the disposition and bring the higher powers of the mind into active exercise, he removed from them the flesh of dead animals. He gave them angels' food, manna from heaven. There it is, friends. But they were not happy. They wanted the fish. And when you read on down in verse 33, Lord, they ate um, quails all night. All day, it, Bible says it came out of their nostrils and God destroyed them, friends. The second rebellion that was instigated by them was this one. Again, friends, again, we, we, we can't go into these too, too much because each one of these rebellion is a lecture by itself. This is an overview. Now, they had contempt for worship reform. Friends, you see the Egyptian worship was loud. And a lot of makeup was linked to it, a whole lot of jewelry, a lot of nakedness. It appealed to the lower passion, a lot of gyration, a lot of noise. And they were used to this in Egypt with their polytheistic self. When they came out of Egypt, God was now trying to reorient their worship. God is saying, hold on. You're worshiping the right God, but in the wrong manner. There is a prescribed way how you worship me. Yeah. And they did not want to sit still in church and listen. They were antsy. And we have come to a point now, friends, where there is this, in this black theology, that they are teaching that if you sing hymns, you have been Europeanized. You know, when I tell people this, I'm not bragging, nothing to brag about. I have probably more African in my vein than more African-American. I'm not Winston Dixon. My, my mother, which is currently alive, Paulette McCurry Henry, my mother is alive today. Her father, Mr. McCurry, came directly from Ghana. As a matter of fact, we have family in Ghana today. So I don't have to go through no... No, no, no ancestor DNA. No, we, we just, we just WhatsApp and we made a connection. So, so let's get it clear, friends. Even though I'm a Jamaican by birth, we don't I don't have to go too far for my ancestry, right? As a matter of fact, all my aunts, they changed their name. They had some serious African name. Ipamba, Efianda, Coriander. They changed. They got some Western name. Joseph had, and, you know but my point is this, friends. My grandfather died before I was born. And when I grew up, as, as, as I was a young boy, he was buried on our, on our property, and there was a pig pen around the corner. And we had to, I'm going to tell you something, boy. Before, before we walked to Trinityville School in the morning, we had to get up, sweep the yard, go clean the pig pen, feed the pigs, then come back, go down to the river, take a shower, eat breakfast, and hike it to Trinityville School. You talk about some serious child 
work and you couldn't get to school late because you get to, they were you gonna get it. Friends, I inquired about my grandfather's disposition. And I was told by my grandmother before she died and my mother, my other siblings, that he was a Christian man, even though he was African, a very stately man. A man who was governed more by a sharp mind. So we think because you're an African, you have to get all and all. That's, a, that's an insult. That's an insult, brothers and sisters. So they're teaching in this black theology, even in our schools, that if you sing a hymn, you have been Europeanized. So therefore now, that the, the, the other extreme now is to go back to that kind of voodoo worship. That's an insult to the black community. Friends, they wanted the calf worship. The calf worship. Look what happened now. Um, Ellen White now comments on this in Pages and Prophet, page 315. She says this. Please read this. Not feeling their helplessness. Feeling their helplessness in the absence of their leader, they return to their old superstitions. It's a superstitious worship. Who are they now? Please read now. The mixed multitude uh -huh. had been the first to indulge murmuring. There's that murmuring again. It's belly aching. And what else? And impatience. Uh -huh. And they were the leaders in the apostasy that followed. This apostasy. Leaders, instigators, authors. Please read now. Among the objects regarded by the Egyptians as symbols of deity. Divine. Was the ox or cow. Uh-huh. And it was at the suggestion of those who had practiced this form of idolatry in Egypt that a calf was now made and worshipped. Friends, I don't have time to go into it because uh, we're going to go into it more in, in, in an upcoming lecture. But friends, it was the mixed multitude who instigated this. Friends, today it's the same thing. You know what C.D. Brooks said before he died? He, and this man was very prophetic in his, in, his, in his preaching. He said this about black worship. He said this. Neo-Pentecostalism will be the death of black Adventists. Take a picture. Put it on Facebook. Friends, it is true. Because we are seeing that the Neo-Pentecostal movement, friends, it is in almost every Adventist black congregation today. Almost. Not to mention the camp meetings, Lord have mercy. Friends, the only thing left now for people to thought is speaking in glossolalia and falling out. Because the stage is set, brothers and sisters. I mean, it is bad. It is almost a Pentecostal worship service. There's nothing serene or sublime or edifying or noble about it, friends. It's buck wild calf worship, friends. And the people who lead out, they are... They have more makeup on than, than Bozo, the clown, the jewelry, the tight dresses. The, one man, his, his, his shirt was so tight. Praise the Lord, man could have raised his arm. Did not to mention the jewelry, which is not acceptable in the eyes of God. It will never be acceptable for us to wear jewelry, nor put on makeup. I don't care who or what pastor give you authority. It's never right in the sight of God. And God's going to take care of all of that as you see in a moment, friends. Friends, the death we are seeing it, friends. We've, we've, we've lost our reasoning. We have lost our religion. Now, why? Remember we talked about uh, Vatican II, the ecumenical movement. We, we did this in the sermon called Type First Lecture. Ecumenical Council, Vatican II, 62, Pope John Paul XXIII. The aim was the merging of all Christian and final, the blending of all religion. That's the aim. The vehicle now to bring the aim, right, is this now. Using celebration activity, celebration terminology, and the power of music to facilitate change. Today, friends, look what we find in our churches now, friends. We're seeing more, more lethargical dance. What if the people are in spandex? What is this to holiness? This is Egyptian worship. This is where we are, friends. This is where we are came out of Vatican II. And you know what? Ellen White saw this, you know. And look what she wrote in Selective Messages, Book 2, page 36. Please read now. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, 
the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Stop there. Okay, friends. Now, let's, now we have a whole lecture on this, so I don't want to go too much. In, but look at the context. Stephen Haskell went to one of our camp meetings in Indiana. And while he was there, he saw a kind of worship that was taking place there. So he was alarmed. He now wrote to Ellen White in look what he saw. She is now responding back to Stephen Haskell about what he saw. She said, what you saw, Haskell, the Lord had shown me would take place just before probation closed. Now, bear in mind, in that time frame, as, you, as you've learned last week from Ella Austin, that there was a Sunday law bill that was about to be placed. So in the context now for her dispensation, the end was about to come. And she said, man, before the probation closes, it would take place. So even, even though they're dead and gone now, but it still has an application for us today. What would take place? Please read now, she says. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. Uh -huh. There will be shouting uh -huh. with drums, uh -huh. music, uh -huh. and dancing. Now, friends, let me qualify. We are not here trying to make atheists out of instruments. We got to be balanced now. Balance the thing for your rasa. Instruments are inanimate objects. In other words, that drum or that piano will gather dust. Orchestra has almost every instrument known to man. But they are played in a skillful manner. So the issue we have with the drums and all these other instruments is not so much the instrument, it's the man behind the instrument. Because if the man is converted, guess what? The instrument will give an unconverted sound. Even though in the sanctuary it's true, there were only stringed instruments used in the sanctuary, right? But the point, I'm not here bashing instrument. It is the man behind the instrument. That's the problem, right? Please, what she says now. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. Uh -huh. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. Praise. Lift your praise. She says what? The what? The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. It's a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan. There it is. Now, friends, stop there. We can't have it both ways. We can't. What do we do with this, this statement? We can't just say, you know what? Give me steps to Christ. Give me other books. Let me sell her devotional books. Right? And all these other. But we, no, friends, you cannot take half. You can't pick and choose. Now, it tells me when we see this neo-Pentecostalism being brought to the forefront in our churches, turn the car over, probation is soon to close. Please read, she says. This is an invention of Satan uh -huh. to, cover up, to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. There it is, friend. Now, we, now we won't go any further because we have a whole lecture on this in itself in this series. So, friends, they were the one they booked the worship reform. They had their own idea of worship and it leveled the camp. The third apostasy, and this is a serious one now, was the Baal Peor. Yes, Baal Peor apostasy. Baal Peor apostasy. This was the final one before they went over into Canaan. They were the authors of this one. Numbers 25, quickly. Numbers 25. The children of Israel now, Moses had died off the sea. Moses had, Moses had passed off the sea now, right? No, Moses hadn't died. I, I think he probably, probably have died, but you think he may have died. Joshua now is about to lead them over into Canaan. They are camped on the banks of Jordan. Look what happened. The Bible says now, Numbers 25, verse 3 says, 1 says now, And Israel abode at Sh Sh Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredoms with the daughters of who? No, who, who was Moab? No, if you go back in history, when Lot left Sodom, Lot, Lot daughter did something that was very, very sick. It's called incest. Lot's daughter got their father intoxicated and they slept with the father. The fruit of incest is retardation. They birth two, not physically in this now, they birth two retarded nations. One was the Moab, the Moabites. 
So the Moabites were cousins really to Israel because Lot and Abraham were family. Now, the Moabites were birthed out of sexual promiscuity. So they were very sexual people, a very sensual people. They would get you with their eyes. Ella Moses Mason would say they wore high heel stocking and fish. They were, they were high heels and fishnet stocking. May he rest in peace, right? Moab. And the Bible says now, and they called the people unto sacrifice to their gods to eat and bow down to their gods. Verse 3 says, And Israel joined himself at Baal Peor, and the anger of God was kindled against them. Look what Ellen White says now about this situation. Please read now. At first, At first there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors. Uh -huh. But after a time, Midianitish women began to steal into the camp. Now, women symbolize church in the context now. Keep on reading. Their appearance excited no alarm. Uh-huh. And so quietly were their plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women. So M Moses was alive. There it is, right? In their what? In their association with the Hebrews mm -hmm. to seduce them into transgression of you get the law friends, of God. Right? What else? To draw their attention to heathen rites, heathen rites? and customs uh -huh. and lead them into idolatry. Wow. These motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship. Friends, don't miss that friendship. Ecumenicalism. They're our friends. They are Christians. We, are, we shouldn't be so standoffish. Look what happened now, right? So that they were not sus suspected even by the guardians of the people. Now here is Balaam now. Balaam was a mixed multitude. Please read now. At Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab. Uh -huh. And it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. Uh -huh. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. Here it is now. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. And look, once they got, look what happened now. We're told they ventured on forbidden ground they should not have gone and now we're told and were entangled in snake and snare they were beguiled by music dancing and allured by the beauty of heathen vessel stained glass windows and nice edifice they cast off their fatal jehovah and they sin brothers and sisters friends you know what happened vatican II. remember this we talked about it, right? Vatican II, right? 65. John 23rd. We know that this man went there. We, we covered this already. Arthur Maxwell. When Maxwell went there, remember what Maxwell said? He said, I sat so close to the Pope. His holiness. You remember, it's, it's, go back and it's in your handout. Well, it's in the first lesson, right? Maxwell was charmed. He was so charmed by the Pope. He said, you couldn't believe I sat so close to his holiness. You know, they, they gave me pass and, and blah, 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 blah. He was charmed or deceived by Rome. Now, when he got back, I didn't share this with you because I didn't want to give you too much now. Now, again, I'm not here bashing Maxwell. I pray he re repented of this mentality, right? So I'm not here condemning this man. That, that I don't have the place to put anybody in hell or heaven. Now, look what happened now, right now. He wrote several things about his encounter with the Pope at Vatican II. Now, this man, these men were um, Spanish brothers. They wrote a book entitled Half a Century of Apostasy. Now, they are, they, 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 they are commenting or they are quoting what Maxwell wrote after he came back from Rome. Now, they're quoting Maxwell now in their book now. This is what Maxwell said, among other things. He said this now. Maxwell now, after leaving Rome now, we must rethink our approach to our Roman Catholic friends. How can we reject an outstretched hand to be a Christian? Hand and, and be Christian, pardon me, right? How can we say that they belong to Antichrist when they reveal many beautiful Christian attitudes? Right? Does this shock you very much, Christian? I hope it does. I think that a lot of our preachers are going to have to throw away a lot of their old sermons. What? This man is bewitched. He's been charmed. 
He said, now, you and me, a lot of old sermons, I scrap a lot of them already. We cannot go on preaching about these dear people like we, like we did 30 or 40 years ago. We cannot stamp them with the mark of the beast. What a terrible thing we've been doing to them all through the years. Friends, I have a problem with that. Several things. The Antichrist system is the Catholic Church. And as long as Catholics remain in the system, they are defiled. Full stop. Full stop, friends. Now, this is a problem, friends. This is a problem. But the man has been charmed, right? And right after this, look what happened now. After this was published, there was a shift now in regards to Catholicism, them as the Antichrist, when we were taught that early on in the history of our country, Protestants taught their children to abhor popery. Yes, in this country. And we would never have them in the government. You better watch Ella Austin's sermon last week and this one. Right? Now, 75 now, B.B. Beach was president of North Europe, West Africa Division of St. Adventist Church. At that time, Beach was also serving as secretary of the World Con Confessional Families to theological branch of the World Council of Churches. Problem there. On 1977, Vatican II was when? 62, 65, right? 20 years later, look what happened now. On May 18, 1977, as Secretary of the World Conference of Church meeting in Rome, Beach presented a medal, a medal to Pope John Paul. This is the medal he gave the Pope. Why would you give the Antichrist? For what? For killing martyrs could you imagine brothers and sisters the u.s donald trump unveiling a statue of adolf hitler and giving it to germany Man, listen he would have he would have to resign why would we give the the, the man who runs a system that ripped babies out of mothers Who's responsible for butchering, murdering, raping a hundred to two hundred million Christians? It's a history. Why would we do that, friends? It tells me there was a shift in the mentality, the mixed multitude. Right? Th this is the research. Look what happened now. So he got the medal. Now, being a prophet, Ellen White saw this. Look what she wrote. Now, in your handout. She said this now. Please read now. Please read loud and clear now. The religion? The religion of Jesus is in danger. Uh-huh. It is being mingled with worldliness. Here it is now. Worldly policy. Mixed multitude. Is taking the place of the true piety and wisdom that comes from above. Uh-huh. And God will remove his prospering hand from the conference. Did you hear that, friends? And I, I'm saying, I'm going to tell you something. I, I probably shouldn't. This is unethical. I'm praying that the money dries up. I'm, because we have too much money, we do foolishness with it. We don't know what to do with it. We, 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 we're minting a, med, a gold medal to get a pope. We don't know what to do with it, friends. Keep on reading, please. Shall the Ark of the Covenant be removed from this people? Shall idols be smuggled in? Smuggled in? Shall false principles and false precepts be brought into the sanctuary? Here it is now. Shall Antichrist be respected? Is you crazy? Shall we pay homage to the man of sin? Have you lost your rockers? You got to be crazy, my grandmother said. That boy got to be crazy. Yeah. You got to be crazy, right? This is serious, friends. Friends, this is where we are. And again, it is the... And this mentality hasn't changed. Friends, his mentality has... Friends, there has been a shift... From Vatican II in our preaching. And friends, and we talk about the educational system. Most of the young preachers today, there's a shift. Shift from where? From prophecy to prosperity, friends. How about get God get your get, get, get your praise on? God's gonna bless. There's a shift from prophecy to, to prosperity. There is a shift now from faith to feelings. The worship services now is, is all subjective. It's gyration. It's monotony. Right, with me, mantras. There is a shift also from eschatology, which is end time preaching, to ecumenicalism. 
And there is not an Adventist gathering that is done today, especially in the black work, that we don't have Sunday singers leading out. They, they, we pay them. This should not be because when we do ecumenicalism, we nutrify and nullify the second angel's message, friend. There is not a young preacher today who has an event going on. He puts a flyer on Facebook. You will see his face and you will see minister so-and-so of music. Check her denomination, Pentecostal, Baptist. Why can't we use good singers? Light and we, we learn God does not do nothing in partnership with the devil. This work will not be finished but with God and Satan putting away differences and work together to rescue heathens. Far from it. So friends, a shift. And then friends, I'm going to say this one soft. Then there's a shift now to social justice. Now let me, let, 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 let me qualify because I don't want to be misquoted. I believe, friends, that all men are created equal and are endowed with certain inner rights. Life, liberty. I believe that we should not harass people because of their sexual orientation or because of even of what they believe is called free will. Just as how you have a right to, to live your life, I have a right to live mine in righteousness. I don't believe we should pass laws to, to become, to write songs that are very, um, you know, uh, uh, that, that are, um, what, what I'm looking, look, looking for now, that are abusive. I don't believe in that, friends. All right? God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. Now, we are seeing a shift now into social justice, especially among the black preachers now. And, the, and I don't want to get too much because I don't want you to, to, to lose what I'm trying to say this morning. But I'll say this. You know, Dr. King once said this. The law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. I believe in that. But as, a, as an Adventist, knowing what I know in regards to the whole great controversy, I'm going to read something from, from one of my favorite preachers, J. Ronald Hoffman. And this, will be, this is where I stand on social justice, right? Hoffman said this. Jesus never sought to change society from the outside in, but rather from the in side out take a picture of that that is profound friends that is a profound statement profound statement and you know what's the answer to social justice the wisest man said it let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandment friends there's no way if those two men who chased down that young man what's his name Am ahmad Ahmad, if those two Caucasian men, if they had the fear of God in him, in them, if they really feared God, and it was, there was no way they would have dro dro shot that man down like a, like, 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 like a common thief. You could have inquired the fear of God. And so what happens now, the issue we have is not passing stiffer laws. The issue is how can we change people from the heart? Because once the heart is changed, the action and God has given us a message. Fear God. Keep his commandments. You wouldn't want to kill if you really and truly, really fear God. So friends, let us not become diverted or distracted. Yes, we're calling for justice and we will always call for justice. But friends, God has raised us up for a special message for a special time. And it is true. In it is included justice for all. And God is the justifier. Right? So friends, here we see now, right? The miss multitude, three major apostasies. The diet, um, worship, and this ecumenicalism. They were the authors. Three terrible apostasies. And, and in, in each case, God was weeding them out. In other words, some were shaken out. Some died at the, at the, um, at the diet. But some remained. At, at Sinai, read, some of them died. At Shittim now, 
was when the final purging took place now. Now, look at this now. Question their end. Let's look at their end now as you wind out. Their end now. What finally happened to the remnants of the mixed multitude? Right? The Apostle Paul wrote this. 1 Corinthians 10. What happened to them? Paul said this now, Nathan. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now, Numbers 25, the same thing that Paul was making mention to, Moses wrote, and there arose and, and, and those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand, a thousand off, shy off. But friends, nevertheless, because of the apostasy at, 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 um, at, at the banks of Jordan, God caused a plague. Could you imagine 23,000 people? I wonder how much members does Florida Conference have, so not. You don't know. Somebody researched that in, in, in the blog. What's the population of the Florida Conference on paper and Southeastern Conference? Could you imagine 23,000 people losing their life in one setting? You talk about whole church is going to be lost? There it is, friends. I, this is serious. That's the whole that lost. Look what happened now. The final, fill it in now. The final purging came at Bel Peor on the banks of Jordan when 24,000 of the mixed multitude were eliminated. All right, my wife said 64,000 Florida Conference. So could you imagine 24,000 people died in one night? That's almost half of the conference. And that number is not even accurate, accurate anyway because the books are always pumped up. If they have 64, I, I'll, I'll probably give them 50 because the books are always inflated, right? We're told this now, right? So now please read now. The final, the judgment. The judgments visited upon Israel for their sin at Shittim uh -huh. destroyed the survivors of the vast company who nearly 40 years before had incurred the sentence, they shall surely die in the wilderness. Wow, friends, their end. Now, friends, so here we see now that that group perished. What about the remnants of the mixed multitude that are alive today in our church? Number nine now, as we wind down, what mighty instrument has God reserved for the purifying of the remnant church? In Hebrews 12, 7, Paul says that there is going to be a mighty shaking. A shaking. Ezekiel 38, 19 says there's going to be a great shaking. Right? A great shaking. A great shaking. Amos 9, 9 says there's going to be a sifting. So the thing that God is going to use to sift out the remainder of the mixed multitude in the church, fill in now, is what we call the shaking and the sifting. You see what the shaking doesn't take out, the sifting will. The shaking is doctrinal. The sifting is persecution. As God had to sift them out before they crossed over into Canaan, so God's going to sift his church and those that remain will go out and give a loud cry. Please read it earlier, right? And she says now, the mighty shaking. The mighty shaking has commenced uh -huh. and will go on. And all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth. That's early writings. Next reference, she says now, volume six, she says. We are in the shaken time. Uh -huh. The time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Volume four, page 51, she says. God is now sifting his people, uh -huh. testing their purposes and their motives. Uh -huh. Many will be, but as chaff. Sorry. No wheat. No value in them. All right, so here we see that. So we don't have to worry about leaving the church and breaking off and starting these, you know, independent churches that are, you know, that have no affiliation with, with the body or don't even desire to be grafted in. God has reserved in his hands. Yeah. See, Moses didn't take, did, didn't take upon himself to purify them. No, no, no. He, he gave them the time and chance. God, God purified that movement. Right? So let's not become discouraged. God has reserved means to purify his church. All of these remain faithful right now. Question number 10 now, right? What are some of the many things that God will use to cause a shaking? Fill it in. 
false theories will cause a shaking. People who don't study. People who don't read. People who make others study for them. False theories. She says, please read when the shaking comes. When the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories, uh -huh. these surface readers, anchored nowhere, are like sifting sand. They slide into any position to suit the tenor of their feelings of bitterness. Then she says now. Daniel and Revelation must be studied, as well as the other prophecies of the Old and New Testament. Let's analyze this, friends. It tells me, friends, that the shaking comes over false theories, doctrinal. Therefore, an anchorage in the shaking time is a proper understanding of the books of Daniel, Revelation, and the other prophecies in the Old and New Testament. False theories. Second thing that we bring on the shaking is the rejection of the straight testimony. The straight testimony. This is the truth preached in love, not round in the corners, with tact, du du and duplicity, and not duplicity, humility, cry filled personality. This will bring on the shaking, right? Early writings, 220, 270, please read, she says. I asked the meaning of the shaken I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Uh -huh. <clears throat> this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Uh -huh. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaken among God's people. Friends, they'll be shaken out. So here we see that false theories cause a shaking. Some are shaken out. Then we have the straight testimony. Some are shaken out. And friend, this is the big one. And friends, we are staring in the barrel of a gun right now. This one, persecution because of Sunday law enforcement. Friends, when this law is passed, you're going to see who, you're going to see if God is really in this ecumenicalism or God is in all this celebration movement, you're going to really see who is real on the Lord's side. We are told as friends, in the absence of persecution, there have drifted into our ranks men or women who appear sound and their Christianity unquestionable. But if persecution should arise, they would go from us. We are told this, prophets and kings, 188, those who have yielded step by step to worldly customs, worldly demands, pardon me, and conform to worldly customs, right, will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, that's laughter, insult, threatment, imprisonment, and death. Friends, when the law is passed, the vast majority is going to leave. This will be the final purging of the mixed muscles, and those who remain will mean business. As we wind on, friends, the Spirit of Prophecy lists 13 classes of people who will be shaken out of the remnant church. And if we are shaken out, it proves that we were a mixed multitude. I ask you now, are we on the list? I remember when I tried out for football at FIU, Division I, I had transferred, so I, lost, I had to come on as a walk-on. And we, 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 um, as a walk on, I was invited back in the summer. We had to resume sometime in mid August. A host of us were assembled at FIU. Boys and girls, we were living in dorms. We went, we went two times a day. One of the first things you had to do was run 11 miles under three minutes, under eight minutes. Serious, 11 miles under eight minutes. That, 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 that's a, that's a, a serious run. It was a three-week practice. At the end of every week, there was a list that was posted. And friends, in eager expectation, we went to see, did I make the cut? And friends, last name, H-I-J-K. Friends, I, I would scroll all the way down. And when I saw the first list, my name, whew, boy, I made the cut. Friends, People who we saw didn't see anymore. They were gone. And each round became more intense. Second week to try out now, friends. All the, all, everybody's gone. The list was posted again. Friends, I went there with eager expectation. This time the list was, was, was a little bit narrow. Went down. 
Salmanim. Not. Friends, only one more cut was left. And I kid you not, a buddy of mine, Nuki, he said, not. Listen, the coach of a problem. You're the only walk-on that is left. And um, it's easy to cut a walk-on and to cut a man who we've given scholarship to. He says, your name is in the ballot because he's the only walk-on. He's a walk-on, whatever. He says, whatever you do, you must do something spectacular tonight. That's what my buddy told me, man. Friends, I kid you, friends. I, I was like, you talk about stress. This is it, friends. And I kid you not, friends. He went to meditation. I was in yoga. I was doing all kind of stuff. Trying to get my game on. I never forget the night, friends. So I said, this is do or die. This is the last game that we're going to play now to determine who makes the squad. And friends, I tell you something, boy. The spirit of Samson came upon me. I'm telling you something, boy. I did some, some fantastic with the ball that, 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 that day, that night. Friends, when the last list came out, my name was on the list. I was the only walk-on that made the cut for FIU Division I men and Division I in no joke. Now granted, I, I rode the bench for the, first, for the first seven games, but boy, after that, man, when, when he let me loose, it was like a lion. But my point is, friends, my name was on the list. I wonder if you fall into this category now. She lists 13 class of people who's going to be shaken out. Here they are. We don't want to be on this list. We don't want to be on this list. No. <laughs> the self-deceived. Lord have mercy. Testimonies, volume 4, page 89. The careless and indifferent. Testimonies, volume 1, page 182. The covetous and selfish. Early writings, page 269. Those who refuse to sacrifice, early writings, page 50. The worldly minded, volume 1, page 288. The compromisers, volume 5, page 81. The jealous and fault finded, volume 1, page 21, 251. The tale bearers, those who accuse and condemn, upward look, 122. The superficial, uh, conservative class, volume 5. Four, six, three. Those who don't control their appetites, volume four, page 31. Those who cause disunity, Review and Herald, 18, 1901. Those, the superficial Bible student, those who live on YouTube and don't read for themselves, they're going to be shaken out. And alas, those who lose faith in the prophetic gift, we not we, they will, by the grace of God, be shaken out. Friends, are you on this list this morning? C.D. Brooks once said this, we spend great time debating the nature of the 144,000 when we should be concerned about their characters. He said, go on, he said, now, the problem I struggle with is where will God find so many? Not one in 20 in her day. They never had Facebook. And they were all on the same theological page. Much more. As today the church is comprised of wheat and tears. But this will not always be, friends. This mixture has kept back the blessings. The mixed multitude. It has, it has kept us wandering too long. Friends, it is time for us to come out of the wilderness. When the law, God's going to shake his church. And when he does, friends... There's going to be a separation. Those who remain will be only wheat carved in white apparel, friends. What I say to you, I say to myself. Exodus 23, verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Let us transition our gaze from that doom, dark, disobedient multitude. Let us focus now on another multitude that John saw. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, he says, And after this, after what? After all is said and done, I behold and lo a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms, victory in their hand. And look what they said now. 
And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation, which is deliverance to our God, which was sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Remember, it was the Lamb that delivered them from Egypt. It was the Lamb that sustained them. Friends, when we get our deliverance, it will be traced back to the Lamb. May God help us to strive, if not in the 144, to be among this great multitude. You know, after Jesus has spoken these things to Peter, these hard truths, he said, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus says, you know, Peter, with man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from thee, ah, whither shall I go? On thy dear Son I now believe. Oh, let me feel thy power and all my wearied ones relieve in this accepted hour. Author of faith, to thee I lift my weary longing eyes. Oh, let me now receive this gift. My soul without it dies. Surely thou canst not let me die. Oh, speak that I shall live. And here I will on weary lie. Till thou thy spirit give. What did thy son, what did thy only son endure before I drew my breath? What pain, what labor to secure my soul from final death? I do believe, I now believe that Jesus died for me and that he shed his precious blood from sin to set me free. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, O oh God, what can we say to these things? But Lord, please hold us in the palm of your hands. Search us and try us. Take from us, O oh God, all that is unlike thee. Separate, O oh God, the mixture from us of the world and worldliness, murmuring and complaining, Father. Make us pure, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we hope you were blessed by this morning's message and challenged. And be like the Bereans. Go back and see if these things are so. We look forward to seeing you this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Elder Austin will be leading out in another important part. I'm, I tell you, I was hooked last time. Boy, that brother, that brother had me hooked. I was sitting at the back. I was biting my fingernails, man. And so he's, he'll be back at 5 o'clock to give us another installment of the Sunday Law, its context, and its crisis. Until then, enjoy your lunch. And remember, please remember to pray for Elder Michael Ray. He should be flying out in a few hours. I'll do my best to update you as I get the various prognosis. God bless you, and until then, Maranatha.